So my name is Gosia Konverska and whoever was here for the previous talk, uh, I work as a kernel developer with the previous speaker Eduardo Serna in the probability and statistics team. And so he was talking about uh, special values and kind of the continuous features in space. What I'm going to be talking uh, now is special events, which is something completely opposite. So these are the discrete events when we just have random points in space or random objects in space. So the examples of such phenomena are the trees, for example, in forests, uh, positions of stars, earthquakes, you know, crime locations, animal sightings, and this whole area really actually started through the forestry and um, and you know trying to evaluate um, the the volume of the of, of the you know how much lumber you have in in your forest. Um, so this is a quick outline. I'm going to talk about some examples of the point collections and patterns, the density of the points, um, the basic model, which is Poisson point process, and then testing for um, the spatial randomness. Um, another way that we can look at the homogeneity and how we can measure it and talk about what it, what, how, how we can model things that are not inhomogeneous, and then about two special other classes of point processes. So what are point collections and patterns? Uh, basically, these are any randomly positioned events in space with the observation region. And the region is important because um, some, um, in some, in, 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 uh, we're going to get to the densities, but basically uh, not having events also gives us information uh, about what's happening in, in space. So we need the, the points and the region. An example, as I said, three locations. Um, what I'm using here to show you is resource data, sample data that is in the Wolfram data uh, repository. And resource data is the, um, gives you the primary content of this um, uh, resource, which is called sample data upon the rosa pine trees. And the spatial point data, which is here returned, is the container for the points and for the regions. And if you look at the, at the properties, you can list all of them. Uh, you can get points out of it and also you can get observation region among other things but these two things are, are crucial for the specification of the spatial point data if you don't provide the region on the input it's going to be computed automatically from the points okay uh, another way to to get some information about your uh, spatial point data is to access through the uh, property summary this is and you can see that this is a data type, which is Cartesian. So we have a Cartesian coordinates as opposite to the other option that we can have, which will be geographical data with geopositions. You can see how many configurations we have, how many points in each configuration, and also uh, dimensionality of the data. And then if there are any annotations. So we have no annotations, so there is no additional information about the points. And the way to um, visualize that is just to use least plot on, on this data. Another example, we have more trees. There's really lots of trees examples that I curated for the, for the Wolfram data repository. So here we have um, other way to access information about uh, the special point data. It's via using the information. And you can see that here we have one annotation, which is called diameter. And this is what it's often recorded with the trees is the diameter at the breast height. And so in, in the situation when uh, annotations are present, then we can use a, a fairly new visualization function, which is point value plot, to show um, points with these annotations. So um, automatically here, the, the diameter size will be colored differently. Okay, more trees. Okay, this is a sampling which is Lansing Woods. And you can see here from the information that this is a Cartesian data set with annotations that are species. And then point value plot will uh, automatically um, give you this categories of, all of, of each tree for the location. Okay, another, uh, another example, uh, any uh, geological features like geothermal features here in the Yellowstone uh, uh, Park. Uh, it could be some sources or some sinks in the in the karst formations. Um, here we have geographical data, so all the data point is a geoposition, and we have no annotations. So um, the easiest way to plot the points is to use the geolist plot. Okay, um, animal sighting for uh, for for birds, right? So here we have counts 
as a annotation and geographical um, points. And um, what, I, what I can do here is to use point value plot and specify that I would like to uh, 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 denote annotations with not the colors, but with the size of the bubbles. So this is the underlying uh, uh, visualization function is geo, geo uh, bubble chart in some way, yes. And um, you can see that uh, the bubbles correspond to size of the, of the uh, annotation there. Um, and the biological locations. Here we have two annotations in a Cartesian data set and the point value plot automatically will try to you know, put as many as of these annotations for the information uh, as you can. And so you see here that there are bubbles and the bubbles have different size corresponding to the area, which is a continuous annotation. And then the on and off the coloring uh, with two colors to the category to which each location uh, falls in. Um, another is the locations of, you know, of the, of the um, epidemic outbreaks where we have um, here, um, the London cholera, this is a, a long, uh, long story. I mean, 1854 cholera outbreak. And here you see that I'm using slightly different accessor because I'm setting resource object directly. And then I can get some uh, description and also get the, uh, the resource data. I'm just gonna go to the next one, which is archeological sites. It's the um, also geolocations. And here the point value plot will, will you know, put the names um, in, the, in the locations. Um, Another activity is it's the locations of the old world cities in France. Um, you can get the, the pure uh, locations using geolist plot, but if you, you know, you see here on the annotations, we have foundation year, name, and, and reign, who was, you know, reigning, was the king or not king at the time. You can just do more fun stuff, you know, visualizing, uh, for example, when they were founded, who was the rule and stuff like that. So this gives us the, you know, the, already some information visually about the, the, the points, the, the special events. Um, now for the computations. We would like to you know, answer the question, is this many points in our region or the few points? And are they you know, dense or not dense in, the, in that sense? So um, point density um, is a function that gives us the number of points per um, unit length, area or volume in the observation region. And here, this is important. What's your observation region? Because the bigger the region, you know, this whole computation will be different because you're gonna have, you know, maybe empty spots or not. And then this, this, this unit um, area will be, will be different for, for each part of the region. Um, the integral of the point density gives us the number of points um, in the region. And we evolve from language. We have three functions that compute densities which is a point density, histogram point density, a smooth point density. And they all um, are the first order point statistics, meaning they just look at the point, not at the point interactions, so only at the points locations. And they have uh, three different approaches to that. So um, let's look at the example. This is uh, beta cells. And um, point density um, as a function is an adaptive density estimator where we have one point per bean. And if the bin is smaller than the, 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 the higher the, the density value. So what is here, it's point density of data. And then I call Voronoi. We also have another method, uh, which is Delonoi, uh, based on Delonoi mesh. This is based on Voronoi mesh. And Voronoi gives us a, a point wise, point wise, point wise constant uh, density function. Point density function, as you can see here in the summary box, um, it's uh, in itself a function and it's a function of location. So you can ask what's the, what's the value of the density at the given point. And here I'm looking at the spatial median of the whole data set. And this is my, my value. Um, we can um, show, so we can, we can plot that it's a function, but we can also use an accessor which is density visualization. And you can see how the density looks like uh, for this set. Now, histogram point density based on a histogram, so it's a partition based estimator, and we can specify shape and size and number of beans, and that would control the, uh, the smoothing here. Um, what I have here is the hexagon shapes, and I specify that I would like uh, 50 beans, and this is how it looks like. 
And so we have a different number of points per beam because we partition the space, not based on points, but based on the region. Smooth kernel, uh, smooth point density is based on the on the uh, kernel estimation. So either smooth kernel distribution or uh, kernel mixture distribution, and it's based on the on the kernel estimation. And so we can control the bandwidth, we can control the specification of a kernel function uh, to uh, for the smoothing. So here, this is how it would look like, and it's a nice smooth um, kind of a heat map of where the where the points locations are. Okay, and the special case is uh, when we have a constant point density everywhere. Okay, and this is the reason why we why 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 there is a model which is called Poisson point process, which is the the model where we, all the points are distributed uniformly, independently of each other, and in every region or every subregion, uh, the number of points is random and it follows Poisson distribution, and. Um, in a, in a way, the consequence of this, and also kind of it's a, it's a, it's a dependence relation, uh, relation, is that the point density for Poisson point process is constant everywhere. And this is what we use to define the model. So we put here mu, which is the constant point density, and d, which is a spatial dimension. And if you look for uh, at all the uh, point processes in Wolfram language, all of them will require to specify the spatial dimension there. Okay, um, we can simulate a point collection. So we have a model we want to simulate. And um, for that, we use the random point configuration function that takes the model and then also takes the, the region in which we want to simulate. And this is the important part because the region dimension and the, re the, the dimension of the process must agree basically to, to make sense of it. And the result is special point data, okay? And uh, we can compute now the number of, of points in the in the unit disk, and this is a distribution, it follows the Poisson distribution, and plot it. And um, the question we we often ask is, if I have a, a a point collection, is this point collection coming from the Poisson point model? So is it completely random? So what we have implemented is the spatial randomness test that would test a given data whether this is uh, this satisfies the, the conditions of the of the Poisson point process. So special randomness test on the data that returns the p-value. And this behaves like all uh, uh, hypothesis tests involved from language that, that are there from earlier. So you can ask for the test data table where you get the, uh, the value of the statistics and the p-value for all the available tests. And you can get the di di diagnostics through the hypothesis test da data. And this is just the list of, of, of properties that you can, you can get. Okay. Um, now, homogeneity measures are the second order point statistics. So now we take to account uh, two points kind of interactions um, a bit. And in the case of a complete spatial randomness, these measures have some meaning. Um, and when we are dealing with analyzing um, a data uh, from out of the wild, we can use them to, for example, compare with the um, Poisson point model. And we have six measures in Wolfram language, uh, Ripley K and Bessag L, empty space F, nearest neighbor G spatial J, and pre-correlation G. And I group them that way because they are related to each other. And so uh, when we take the, um, the Ripley K at given radius, and multiply by the mean point density of the data, we get an expected number of points within distance um, R of a typical point. And Bessagel is just a scaled ver version of, of Ripley K. Um, now the empty space F gives the probability of finding a point within a distance, you know, given distance R of an arbitrary location. Right, so this location is just a location within the observation region, not necessarily the data point. Uh, nearest neighbor G will give you the probability of finding another point within a distance um, uh, R from a typical data point. So it's kind of like um, gives you the probability of, a, of, of finding a point, but depending where you start. Are you starting at the arbitrary location or at a typical point? And spatial J is just a function of the two. And um, what is uh, special about Poisson point model um, is that uh, the, 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 this, the probability uh, so of finding a point 
um, it's the same whether we start from arbitrary location or from a typical point. So our special J for Poisson point process is always one. And then uh, per correlation G, also called radial distribution function, is uh, proportional to the probability density of finding two points at a given distance apart. And um, it's not a correlation in a, um, in a prob probability sense because the values are ranging from zero to infinity and um, one is the value uh, that corresponds to the complete spatial randomness. Okay. Um, I have five minutes left, so I'm just gonna move on. Um, I will post this notebook and you can look at the example of working with, with another set of trees for, the, uh, for using um, uh, homogeneity measures. Um, in homogeneous Poisson point process is a point process uh, when we remove the, the, the condition that the points must be distributed uniformly. So we, again, we have independent points, but they can vary in density. And you can specify a density via function, okay? And then you can simulate. And what is interesting is that we can also um, specify the density um, via non-parametric point density. So we can use the output uh, of point density or histogram point density or smooth point density and input this as a density function to inhomogeneous uh, Poisson point process. This is a very long name, but... You know, uh, where we get it. So then I, when I define it, I can then simulate and then you can see that what we get is very similar to what we had at the beginning when we are simulating from the, um, from the uh, model given by the formula. Okay. Um, interaction point processes um, are point processes where the placements of the points is somewhat restricted by the interaction between points, kind of. Um, so I cannot have points that are too close to each other, or maybe they are discouraged to be close to each other, or maybe they are attracted to each other and they actually are forced to be closer to each other. And um, these are generally known as Gibbs point processes. And um, we have, um, I cannot feed them all here, but um, we have uh, um, these special cases of the Gibbs processes implemented. So you can see that the, 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 the little plot in the middle column gives you the per potential function. So for the hardcore point process, you can see that the points cannot be closer than a given radius. And uh, this is this radius is gonna be called hardcore radius. For the Strauss point process, you see that the points are discouraged to be closer than a given radius, but it's not impossible for them. And that's what we call soft core uh, radius. And then we have, you know, uh, the mixture of the two. So we can have the, the, the softer core and a hard core uh, in a Strauss hardcore point process and, and such. Um, um, I want to just um, show a bit more about the hardcore point process. It has the, um, the three parameters, uh, the density, the point density, and the hardcore radius. And uh, when you um, have um, let's say sample, which is maybe not super populous, uh, it might be hard to distinguish the hardcore point process from uh, a Poisson point process. So these are the two plots of two simulations of these two processes. And I mean, just looking at that, I cannot tell you what, which one is which in, in, a, in an easy way. And so um, what we can do, we can test, right? So using the spatial randomness test, but you can see here three tests, one of them fails and two pass. Okay, so that may also not be conclusive necessarily. It's one way to, to kind of test what, what, you know, what, what, what is the data coming from. Another way is to feed hardcore point process uh, using estimated point process and then test the goodness of fit with the uh, point process fit test. Okay, so this is kind of going um, along all the probability and statistics, what we had for distributions and the stochastic processes. So estimate, you give a data, you give a model, and then test, um, and you can see also the results of the um, of the you know, of the test here in the p-value column, right? And the other way is to um, look at the homogeneity measures because if we look at the nearest neighbor G, uh, then we know that in a hardcore process, a point process, the, the points cannot be close to, to each other. So if I look for probability of finding a point 
you know, this probability will be zero for the small values, right? So this is the this is the sampling from um, this is I mean computation of the nearest neighbor G for the hardcore um, sample and for the Poisson, you know, sample. So you can see that the that there is a clearly this hardcore radius being flat for the small uh, distances. Um, right. And similarly, that, that also shows on the per correlation G because this is a similar uh, concept here. And what I want to say is that the hardcore characteristics may not be visible when, when we have a small sample size, right? But also when we increase the point density to, to have a, a bigger sample size, uh, we cannot keep doing it. I mean, this, this, this sample size would temper off because the points cannot be packed too close to each other. So this is an example when I have increasing densities and simulate from the hardcore point process with a given hardcore radius for, it, for, for this increasing densities. And you can see how the sample size is basically tapering off at some value. And um, we can compute the point statistics. This is the per correlation G and see how, you know, the, the hardcore radius is actually starts showing up when the sample size is larger. Okay. Um, and uh, yes, one more thing. Um, two more things. Uh, one more thing is it's um, using hardcore uh, point process to fit balls into some 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 space. In here, I have a cuboid. As it's a mathematician, we take a spherical cow, so we always have everything. It's you know perfect. So cuboid, and we have balls of the same radius that can at most touch. And so if they can at most touch, then it means that the distance between the centers must be at least two times the radius. Right, and so we can model the scenario of the placement of the centers uh, of these balls with the hardcore point process, and this is what's what's happening here. I can visualize the centers, but then I can also place the the balls into this container and have them. And then because we know that the number of of uh, points is going to taper, taper off when we um, increase the, uh, the the density, you can roughly estimate what's the maximum number of these balls that we can pack into this cuboid, and this is a this is a random, uh, you know, this is random simulation. So whenever we uh, rerun this, we're gonna get this maximum will be a different number, but it gives you a rough, a very rough estimate on that. Um, and I want to touch also that we have cluster point processes about which I'm not gonna talk much because I'm running out of time here. So, um, but. Um, I will be um, having office hours with my colleague Eduardo uh, at 3.30 uh, today um, in the lower level. And also I'll be available Thursday, Friday throughout the conference. So just, you know, stop me, ask me questions. And um, this is also a link for the data examples where to find them in a, a Wolfram data repository that I showed you earlier. So thank you.